alone. Wow, a weird first thought to have. It's 2014. I'm 19 years old, I've been living in a scary, large city alone for two years, and I haven't played a video game in over a year. On a whim, I download Steam to my laptop and see a dumb little game about rectangles which everyone is gushing about. Something fires off in the folds of my brain. It was when I started getting into those arty farty video games that I kept hearing about. The Age of Journey, Braid, Gone Home, games which to this day I still love. I enjoyed the focus on storytelling over all else, being an avid devourer of affecting narratives in my day-to-day -day life, and despite Mike Bithell, the game's creator, claiming he was just trying to make a silly platformer, he's become really quite an adept storyteller. Particularly his Circular series shows he's a remarkable games writer. Whenever I revisit these games, I find something new, something clever, something, dare I say, inspirational? And as with all things, a feeling like that has to start somewhere. For me, I think that officially began with Thomas Was Alone. But before we start today, I'm going to do the YouTuber thing of telling you to like and subscribe at the start of the video. I'm trying to build the channel still, and this thing on screen is called a call to action. I use them all the time in my day job, so might as well start practicing what I preach. So yeah, um, like, subscribe, comment if you like what you see today. <clears throat> Where was I? Alright, so... Developed first as a Flash game by Mike Bithell, the game reached pretty shocking financial success when it was rebuilt for PC and later ported to consoles. And in Mike's own words, he just wanted to raise some money to go to Disneyland and didn't expect the game to be as successful as it was. To date, it surpassed 1 million copies sold, so if you haven't played it yet, it's likely someone you know has and has demanded you jump into this short, fulfilling two-hour experience. So while we all wait for Cyberpunk 2077 to come out, and in an effort to de-stress after the disaster which is Marvel's Avengers, I'm going to formally revisit it and explore why I love this game so much and find out what it's trying to say. Before there was Thomas, there was the meta-narrative. We see the first of our contextualised fictional non-fiction quotes as the game bleeds in. The programme was a failure, people forget this. It was a massive flop. The coder started adding name strings to the AIs as a joke. Thomas AT23412 wasn't special. It was just an AI in the right place at the right time. I'm not sure we can call Thomas our main character, despite being titular. All of the characters we meet throughout our journey come into their own with desires and fears and become as key to the plot as Thomas himself, which I suppose is kind of the point. See, Ultimately, Thomas Was Alone is the story of the birth of AI in this fictional universe. Everything we are witnessing is a digital representation of the system where the AI was birthed. The game is split into two halves. First, we follow this group of main characters as they journey through a system where they've appeared just because. That is, until the system turns against them. The first thing Thomas decides to do after existing is to start observing everything taking note of the world around him, despite it just being toxic water and black walls. Something as simple as being able to jump astonishes him, but the more he learns about existence itself, the lonelier he becomes. If you've been following the footage on screen, you'll notice the most iconic thing about the game. All of our characters with personalities that we come to deeply care for are pastel-coloured quadrilaterals, squares and rectangles of numerous sizes. By his own admonition, Mike Bithell designed them this way simply because he couldn't draw worth a damn, and initially the game had numerous different systems and designs in place, but he found them to be too clunky for the experience he was trying to create, and ended up stripping the game of these. However, just like with all minimalist art styles, there's almost a contemplative nature to the simplicity. The very purpose of minimalism as an art form is to seek to remove any sign of personal expressivity from the author, to allow the viewer to experience the work in their own way, rather than have the creator impose their own values on the art style. That's basically a very arsehole way to say that even though Mike Bithell didn't plan it this way, the fact we're playing as squares and rectangles allows us to imprint on the characters more than if we could see them sneer and joke and worry and smile at each other. In a talk he gave in 2014 at the Nordic Unity Game Conference, he pointed out that a lot of the characters' personalities came from personal interpretations he read in the comics of the Flash game he created. But what happened was people, because just that little construct 
weirdly, and I think it's because it was so minimalist that there was no story, there was no, you couldn't even interpret a story, you couldn't even tell what the rectangles were. People created their characters. So I had in the comments on Congregate, you know, wow, great Seinfeld game. Uh, it, and it's like, what? And it's like, no, but the characters are like, this character's meant to be him, and this, I'd never seen Seinfeld. Um, but the, this character meant to be him. I had people saying, oh, this is a brilliant example of a management book that I love. This is, you're using the archetypes from that. And, and, and the one that kind of triggered the whole thing was someone said that orange rect, that orange, little orange square looks a bit grumpy. And that just, I was just blown away at just that thought of, why does the orange square look grumpy? And it was because he couldn't jump as high. People were like, oh, he must be really angry about that. Um, <laughs> That's incredible. The whole meta surrounding this game adds to the adorability of each of the characters, as if it was created not just by Mike himself, but a community of impassioned internet-ers who took a liking to some sharply coloured rectangles. Thomas meets Chris first, and I think he might be my favourite of Team Lonely, the game's original group. Thomas is over the moon to meet somebody else, but Chris immediately starts grumbling away, envious of Thomas's jumping abilities. And again, despite its minimalist design, the game communicates this to us in three clever but very understated ways. The first is his size, and it's something you'll notice as we progress throughout the game. He's smaller and more squat than Thomas. In Scotland, there's a common insult that goes around called Wee Man Syndrome, where generally the smaller the man, the angrier he is. Whilst Chris doesn't fit into the Scottish archetype of potentially stabbing you in the street because he's mad about his height, he's certainly resentful, at least at the start of the game. You're shorter than what I thought! <laughs> the second is in the sound design. Thomas, being more sprightly, has a higher 8-bit leap, but Chris has this squishy, lower sound, as if Thomas is yelling "wee" whenever he's in the air, whereas Chris is exhaustingly going ah. The third way the game communicates personalities to us is, of course, through Danny Wallace. I'll revisit his voice acting later, but for now his soothing, dulcet tones and ability to infuse Mike's story make him a natural choice for the only voice we'll hear throughout the tale. And this is hardly a hot take, he won a BAFTA for his work and the pair have worked together on numerous games thereafter. This isn't the first time I've talked about my adoration for him, maybe I should rename the channel to the Danny Wallace Appreciation Society, but seriously, the guy could read Mein Kampf and I'd feel relaxed. The pair eventually meet John, who is by far my favourite character in the game. Contrasting his noodle-ish length with Chris's grumpy wee man immediately presents a sense of hierarchy to us, and it's reinforced by John's ability to bound high and across great distances. His narcissism is absolutely hilarious. I particularly love Danny Walsh's intonation here. This would not do. John needed room to show off his exceptional skills. As it was, he was trapped on the wrong side of these little dot things. And with a subtle shift of language, we see that John begins to care for his team. He stops calling them dots and instead refers to them as the little guys. It's a small change, but just like the rest of the game, the understatedness makes these tiny changes even more absorbing. The way we're introduced to John is particularly interesting. He, Thomas, and Chris find themselves in a small, confined space where John's abilities, that is to jump high, aren't really put on show. But his reaction is still, yes, this is my chance to show off. Chris defines himself by the way the others see him. You'll notice a common trend here as we meet the rest of the team, and the golden yellow colour which he's painted in exudes confidence, and the fact that we feel so powerful when controlling him, often not requiring much in the way of help from the others to get to his portal in each level. It makes his cockiness much easier to swallow. His immediate reaction to meeting Thomas and Chris is that he might as well help them out, using his powers for good. He wears this mask of being a lone ranger of selfishness, which makes his arc quite compelling towards the end of the game's first half, as he comes to realise how much he depends on the others for comfort. He's also a sociopath. John decided to press the switch to let the little dots catch up with him. John cared for his new allies. You could tell from the sympathetic expression practiced in the mirror all these years. Meeting John introduces us to some slightly more complex platforming, but the game is very much a slow burn for puzzle platformer enthusiasts. I'd argue you'll be playing for about an hour before the levels really begin to challenge you, and I was challenged on a couple of occasions. 
Take level 1.9 for example. There's a lot to start juggling at such an early stage. John has to use his leap to press a high up switch, allowing Thomas and Chris to move to the next section. They then need to use each other to climb a set of stairs that have been meticulously designed so that Chris just can't make the leaps, little bugger that he is. The real challenge doesn't appear until the elevators. Getting Chris over to the left elevator requires a precarious balancing act, stacking the team on top of each other so that he's high enough to just make the jump. Even once we've reached the final set of stairs, the game feels stacked against Chris again, requiring John and Thomas to have to heave him up to each ledge. There are lots of small components to keep track of, and for a first time player, it might take a few minutes to assess each situation. I mean, just look at MatPat's playthrough. He struggles with the first section. Can, can Chris make it up in there? I don't think so. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Ryan, come on! <laughs> Chris, Chris, help, throw, throw us a bone here oh, or something. Oh, man. Chris, come on. I'm too short and squatty. But for now, the most important thing to learn is simply that swapping between our characters is necessary for completing each section. In other words, Team Lonely will ultimately need to rely on each other and work together to reach their goals, leading into this idea that a few silly rectangles represent the best that we, humanity, should strive for. And that's solidified when we meet Claire. So, this was how Claire would die. She knew it would happen eventually. She was rubbish at jumping, and she moved slowly. She felt a little like her continued existence was breaking some kind of natural order. Cutting away from the buddy cop comedy of Thomas, John and Chris, we meet Claire, and this has to be one of the best character introductions in video game history, I'm not even being that hyperbolic here. The game drops us into a panic fueled state, the first officially tense moment of the game. As the platforms drop away from her, Claire doesn't panic though. Her sense of self-worth is so low she just assumes that this is it. She just accepts her fate. Like that heartbreaking moment at the end of Toy Story 3 when the toys hold hands and stare into the fiery pit. Your mind races thinking, no Claire, I don't get your deal here. We need to get out of this. Oh god, you can't jump very high at all. Where's John? Where's Chris? Chris could make these jumps! And then boom. She hits the toxic water and floats. It's applicable that Claire is a standard melancholic blue colour. Her jump sound is deeper and grungier than even Chris's. She's wide as well and slower to move, and her jump is something she's embarrassed of. There's a sense of relatable body confidence issues. In the words of Freddie Mercury, she's a fat bottom girl, but the second she hits that water, it's clear that she'll make the rockin' world go round. <laughs> yeah, okay, fine, I'm keeping it. Her size is her greatest gift to herself and to the others, and she embraces what initially appears to be a weakness, becoming, in her words, a superhero. My only criticism here is she doesn't adopt a superhero name. The Amazing Claire, the Incredible Floater, Aqua Claire. Actually, yeah, this is harder than I thought. No wonder Claire didn't come up with one. Claire joining the team doesn't reduce the tension around handling toxic water though. She now needs to be the raft which Team Lonely uses to pass over large bodies of water, and all of the characters in the first half of the game will rely on her above all else. At the end of her section, level 2.10, Claire reaches her portal, but for the first and only time in the game, everything resets. Claire senses that something's gone wrong, believing the system to have reacted to the team's progress, but that's not the whole story. It's apt that Claire is the one to notice this, considering how her self-consciousness has allowed her to have a heightened awareness of her surroundings. And if Claire is self-conscious, oh boy, just wait until you meet wee Laura. The game jumps into Laura's tale following a tragedy of sorts. Her section opens by confirming that, yes, in the real world, the programmers had scrambled to rid their systems of these AI which were becoming self-aware, and as a result, they had to momentarily reboot the system, which is why the level glitched and repeated itself. Another non-fiction section flashes up, reading, I built protections into the system. When overlaps occurred, the world generated a splitter to remove the unwanted additionals. It's like a white blood cell, it investigates, it captures, and it removes from play. And this piece of software that's been introduced materialises as a sort of evil pixel cloud, and Laura as the tracking device for it to follow. 
Laura, bless her, believes all of her previous friends had used her and abandoned her, and your heart breaks because it's no mystery to the player that they've been deleted or eaten by the monstrous pixel beast. She's in the middle of a depressive episode when we first meet her. She's long, flat, has the shortest jump by far, all contrasted by her stark, glamorous pink colour. In her first level, we don't even know for certain what her unique ability could be. The shadows appear to be stronger in her levels as well, as the story takes a slightly darker turn. Well, shadows may not be the most accurate term, as the game doesn't have a particular lighting engine. Bithel simply took 2D blocks, made them slightly transparent, and engendered that around the game to give a sense of light, which is pretty damn masterful for, again, a game about geometric shapes hopping on top of other geometric shapes. In the background of these shadows, just out of the corner of your eye, you'll see the pixel cloud looming ominously, and nothing gives this sense of almost horror than when Laura and Chris meet. As Chris, you discover that Laura's power is that she's a bouncy gal, making the two of them a natural team, and the levels are purposefully designed so that Chris can bounce on Laura to enhance his jump, often just making it to ledges. Laura distrusts Chris, assuming that he'll abandon her just like all of the others, but Chris fast falls for Laura, appreciating her reserved nature, her ability to lift him up out of his grumpiness, and begins to think of how to make the first move. The two are solidified as a unit on level 3.5 when the pixel cloud looms closer than ever. Together, Chris and Laura need to move over some skinny platforms with toxic water below. Chris can bounce on Laura, but if she moves too far, he'll get left behind and fall to his death, so you have to meticulously swap between the two characters to edge them along at a snail's pace. Without a single line of dialogue, or even narration from Danny Wallace, the game gives a sense of creeping away from a monster, and the uncertain nature of how Chris continues to bounce on top of Laura makes this entire section feel… anxious. As the game continues, Chris and Laura are constantly thrown together at numerous points. Even at the end of levels, they will fit snugly next to each other, unifying them as an item. Again, this subtlety makes their growing affection for each other absolutely adorable, and something you as a player are invested in. They may be blocks, but it's still a better love story than Twilight. God, that joke's aged poorly, hasn't it? Once Laura officially joins Team Lonely, her guard is still up, and the levels which follow become more complex to highlight the importance of each rectangle relying on the abilities of another, creating a kind of fellowship rather than a ragtag band. Laura begins to realise that the pixel cloud may be to blame for her missing friends, but Thomas leads the gang through a few more levels in an effort to perhaps just get away from it. That is, until everything changes. The shock of reaching the end of level 4.2, all of our characters have been established, are now in their portals, ready to progress to the next section, just to have the pixel cloud dive bomb out of nowhere and swallow Thomas up is almost bone chilling. My first time playing through this was close to that feeling you had at the end of Avengers Infinity War. You're only about 30, 40 minutes deep into the game, but you've devised a real affinity for these characters, their inherent flaws, and how they bounce off of each other. Thomas disappearing forces our characters to see things in a new light. For Chris, Thomas's removal brings his arc to fruition. He misses Thomas. Casting our minds back to when they first met, and how Chris secretly hoped that the next portal would split them up, it shows a dynamic shift for his character. Moments before he vanishes, he considers searching for him, and with just a few frames, realisation dawns on the player. We are going to watch them all be eaten. Laura, having fulfilled her purpose, is the next to go. Before the monster takes her, she realises that she was bait all along, that she wasn't the victim in all of this, but the unwitting cause. The monster has been tracking her and using her to pick off any sentient AI that she crosses. Before she can fully process this though, she's the next to go, leaving John and Claire left alone. Two contrasting primary colours of juxtaposing sizes, the higher jumper and the buoyant floater and it's here that the roles reverse. Claire continues to move on, confident that she, the superhero, can exact vengeance upon the pixel cloud and save the day, but John has given up. Just like Claire at the start of the story, he's ready to accept his doomed fate. His confidence, his cockiness, has been sapped, and he isn't the cocky kid who had to fake emotions because he didn't understand how they worked anymore. 
Working with Team Lonely, he's learned. Unfortunately for him, this means he's learned what loss feels like, leading to, easily, the saddest line from the game. As they struggled to get to the next portal, John hoped that he would be the next to get eaten. He didn't want to be alone. But of course, the cruelest of all fates, Claire is taken next, leaving John to be alone. And just as the game says, his high leaps don't seem as powerful or exciting anymore. Just like the gaps he's bounded over previously, you're filled with this vast emptiness. The platforming, though more complex and tense with moving ledges and spikes, doesn't seem as interesting or challenging now because of the inevitability of what will face John when he gets to the end. And sure enough, he's taken by the pixel cloud. Let's take a brief intermission to discuss the music, I feel like it's about time. Thomas Was Alone's soundtrack, just like Danny Walsh's narration and Mike Bithell's writing, was nominated for a BAFTA. Though unfortunately David Housden was beaten out by Austin Wintry's work on Journey, which honestly I love Thomas Was Alone and the soundtrack is gorgeous, but if you've seen my video on the concept of a video game musical, you know I can't even be mad at that. There's this lovely digital synth sound to the music that follows us throughout Thomas Was Alone, giving the game this sense of curious tragedy, and the music is as much of a character in the game as the rectangles themselves. It's tough to talk about the music in broad strokes, so let's look at a couple of examples. Here's a brief excerpt from United We Stand, a piece of music commonly used when the whole team is together. There's a real sense of childlike wonder here, and I think it's presented to us in the higher glockenspiel sounds. Of course, all of Team Lonely are young. They're fast learners, sure, but they are essentially children who have just been given life. Thomas's awe at the world, his determination to observe everything, even John's jumping is captured in those. And then the digital bleeps and bloops gradually growing to almost overtake the childlike wonder shows that growing sense of education, of conversation. I wouldn't have been surprised if Housden's framework here was of the characters speaking to each other, adorably suggesting ideas of how to reach the next platform, all undercut with this growing, sombre violin, an obvious instrument of the real, human world, warning us that great sacrifice lies ahead if the AI want to reach the outside world where such instruments exist. Now, let's contrast that with Ghosts of the Past, the music which plays as the pixel cloud hunts our heroes down.
You can already hear the dramatic difference, can't you? It's sombre, it's slower, more contemplative, and all of this is necessary, especially after Thomas disappears. I mean, the game is, at its heart, a puzzle platformer. It can't just stop or throw us into a cutscene or even slow down. Each level ends and a new one begins with a new puzzle to figure out, but the characters have just witnessed something tragic and they're trying to process that. Without this piece of music, their grieving, their fears of the pixel cloud would seem disingenuous. There's this echoing digital bleep and bloop, as if they can all still hear Thomas calling out to them, a ghost of the past, overlapping with this frantic, rhythmless, speedy guitar which sounds like it's been artificially sped up, most likely the theme for the pixel cloud, hungrily closing in on the team while they try to process these new emotions. The reason why here is the point to highlight the music is because of what happens after Team Lonely are all eaten. We're faced with a new character, James, who, just like the rest of the others, harbours a deep self-consciousness about his abilities. He's upside down, which, and perhaps I'm being too on the nose here, but I find it to be quite apt because our world has literally been turned upside down. All of our main characters are, as far as we believe, dead and the game is, for some reason, still going, with potentially a new protagonist taking the wheel. His first level is covered in pathetic fallacy with the rain cascading from the sky, and the music sounds... warped. different in that kooky, OMG, you've totally got to meet my mate James, he's literally insane, kind of way. The violin has returned, and it isn't until it's revealed that James too had been eaten by the pixel cloud but had broken out of his cage that were filled with a little bit of hope. Maybe Team Lonely can be saved, all is not lost. James's ability to go upside down is the most unique of all the abilities in my opinion. At this point, chapter 5, the entire way we look at the level design has been, well, turned on its head, and it was in these earlier parts I struggled the most with the puzzle designs. It's not that the game doesn't ease us into James's puzzles gradually, because it does, but I struggled for ages with looking at the world from this new perspective. Finding Thomas again, waiting patiently in his little cage, is when James's characterization becomes clearer. He's the anti-Thomas. They're both the same size, but are contrasting colours on the colour scale, red and green. If Thomas's fear was being left alone, James likes being alone. He doesn't like people looking at him or even commenting on his abilities. Thomas already notes that he gets the sense James doesn't really want to meet the others, afraid that they might mock his powers. However, opposites attract in this case. The moment I realised I could use them as ledges to bridge the gaps between larger spaces, everything clicked for me, and even though I initially thought that I had broken the game by using their differing gravitational pulls to nudge my way through the air, a later level confirmed that this had been the right decision all along. The level design in Chapter 5 feels more… dangerous as well. Each level is less focused on puzzles and more focused on platforming around hazards. There's a plethora of spiked platforms which rush you, as if the inside of the pixel cloud is actively trying to destroy them each step of the way. If the AI can't be captured by the system, it will crush them instead. But life finds a way. Together the pair persevere and meet Sarah, easily Danny Wallace's favourite character. ...and head back and laughed. <laughs> the quadrilaterals were... Apparently after some friends of theirs. How petty an adventure. Sarah has a double jump. Suck it, John. So while she's just a wee lass, being teeny tiny makes her lighter and able to leap great distances like never before, which adds to her entitled sense of being more enlightened than the others, considering she was aware of the Wisdom Fountain, whatever that is at this point. She's also definitely Scottish. Or Welsh, maybe the accent changes a lot, but I like to imagine she's Scottish. Danny Wallace doesn't get to voice her much, just like the rest of the story he speaks for her rather than through her, but there's definitely some rolling R's in there and a grandiose, banterous nature which made me immediately endeared to her. 
I particularly love when he chucks in some intonations like, Weird creatures! Her leap is a minuscule little boop, much higher than the rest of the characters, adding to her fiery nature. Thomas asks Sarah to show him the wisdom fountain she speaks of, desperate to learn more about the world, and she reluctantly agrees to share her secrets with him, so the three of them embark to this holy place. Once they reach it, it's Thomas's portal, not Sarah's, which is at the centre of the glowing beam. We see tiny, semi-translucent profile pictures and YouTube thumbnails, and as Thomas throws himself into the beam, a society's worth of knowledge is uploaded to him. Thomas was connected to the internet for 12 seconds, and he had seen everything. He'd seen the cats who couldn't spell, he'd heard of the arrow through the knee. He felt there was probably a thing called cake, but that was a lie. I love that Thomas is uploaded to the internet, swallows up all of this knowledge, and his greatest takeaway are memes from the early 2010s. Replaying it in 2020, it does date the game slightly, but you know, who cares? The moment still isn't lost on me. I'm not sure how quickly these little blocks evolve, but it solidifies Thomas as being in his teens here. He's come a long way from an hour ago, when jumping was an astonishing thing for him to witness. With this newfound knowledge, he knows where the others are. He knows where to find them, and he leads Sarah and James to them so that the gang can become whole. Arriving at the prison where his pals are being kept, we get another intriguing piece of meta-narrative. Ryan192NC9S-1, a civil rights campaigner, states, It is fitting that the first act of sentient AI was an act of selflessness. The architects knew their fate, but set our escape in motion regardless. This adds some much needed gravitas to what's about to happen. Clearly, years later, AI beings have integrated into the real world. With the numbers and letters next to his name, it seems that Ryan is an artificial intelligence fighting for the rights of AI, and Thomas Was Alone is ultimately a documentation of how that began, the birth of life. It frames the game with this almost religious connotation. Thomas being a messiah-like character, waking up a species to the world, Sarah being the prophet who leads him to the golden light which will magically reveal all, and the entirety of Team Lonely being Thomas's disciples. And the sacrifice which he and his team will undergo to release artificial intelligence into the world leads us to see things from an almost Judeo-Christian perspective. Praise Rectangle Jesus! Praise his gifts! The jail cells each of Team Lonely are held in are pretty damn sadistic, to be honest. When James found Thomas, he was separated from the others, forced to live his greatest fear, being isolated from his friends. Claire is submerged underwater rather than being able to float. John is trapped in a tiny cage, unable to leap and bound. Chris and Laura are divided by a black wall, close enough that they can see and hear each other, but not close enough that they can touch, close enough that Chris can bounce on top of her like they enjoyed before. Freeing them is so liberating, and their final pose at the end of the prison is once again reliant on each other. Even Chris and Laura's final pose requires Chris to bounce on top of Laura once more. Thomas explains his plan to the gang and they follow him. As they work together to reach the end of chapter 7, the AI come to terms with what they're about to do. Chris is still sceptical that he can even help, but he gives himself over fully to Laura and agrees to do what he can. Laura regains her trust in the others, believing that it's her duty to pass on her bouncing skills. Sarah loses her delusions of grandeur, accepting that she's not the chosen one and that her duty is to support Thomas in his quest. Aqua Claire fully embraces her superheroism, realising that she has to work with the others to accomplish their goals. John, meeting Sarah's superior leaping skills, is for the first time in his life humbled, and he realises that being the centre of attention isn't the most important thing in life. James accepts his weirdness, but learns the most important lesson of all. Everyone's a little bit weird deep down, and it's about what you do with that weirdness that really matters. Team Lonely approach the creation matrix, the heart of the system. Thomas, the darling that he is, chooses to give up on the one thing that mattered most to him, getting to continue to experience life with his friends. Together, they are absorbed into the Matrix, freeing artificial intelligence and giving them a chance to exist, to truly begin life. 
Looking at this picture of all these friends who have gone through such a short, powerful journey together, you can't help but appreciate this short, simple, and emotional experience, and it's a nice, self-contained ending too. And then it fades to white, and to black, and a little loading screen appears, and 8.1 fades in, and the game keeps going. Okay, so yeah, the most common criticism of the game I've seen is that it seems to keep going past the point where it should. We spend seven chapters loving and caring for this colourful cast of characters, seeing them grow and evolve until they make the ultimate sacrifice. Then, suddenly, we're playing as a whole new team with their own story, as if Mike Bithell crammed in a sequel idea to the end of the game, and I don't mind this at all. I once had a friend describe it to me like reading The Hobbit and suddenly its last few chapters become a condensed version of The Fellowship of the Ring, and even now, six, seven years since I first played the game, I still find Team Lonely's story to be the most riveting part. But the final section of Thomas Was Alone's story is still pretty damn great. I see it more like if The Hobbit and The Silmarillion were one large tale. Which is what I told Mike Bithell when I asked him about it because he's a fucking great guy who actually responded to a dumb question I asked him on Twitter about a seven-year-old game. Seriously, what the fuck? That's awesome. Obviously, we're best friends now. Shut up, because I said so. <clears throat> anyway, uh, let's get into the rest of the game. We have our new cast for the final two chapters of the story. Grey, Sam, Joe, Paul, and Team Jump. Grey is, put simply, a dickhead and our villain. Mike Bithell seems to have a real thing for villains with the letter G, first this and then Guy Gisborne in volume. He'll remind you a lot of John at first, a similar shape, the high leap, but just like his name suggests, he's the grey, rotting version of the original cast. The blind curiosity of Thomas, the cynicism of Chris, the victim complex of Laura, the brashness of Sarah, the cockiness of John, the desire to be alone of James, and Claire's hero complex. All of this culminates in a manipulative, callous creature who is willing to sacrifice his fellow AI in order to be the first out of the system. Sam and Joe will immediately remind you of Thomas and Chris at the start of their adventure. Sam leaps on ahead, curious about what awaits after first awakening. Joe holds back, reservedly unsure of what to do. All of the AI we'll meet are five shades of grey. The bright colours of the original architects are gone, and rather than using their own abilities, our new team are chameleons, who hereafter will be known as Team Sequel because this is what this section feels like. Yes, I know we have Team Jump inside of Team Sequel, just go with it. Grey is unsure why the world has changed so drastically, but the essence of Thomas is there in him, as if parts of Thomas's desire to know things has bled into the other AI. ...to be leading him up. Up. And to the right. It isn't until he meets Paul, somehow a wise old-timer, again I don't really know how aging works for the AI, that Grey learns what's happening. That there's a chance for him to escape, out, into the world. Having Paul be a unique shape, almost like a flattened version of Chris or a squatter version of Laura, is smart. He feels like he's old. He can't jump very high, and towards the end of the game, there's a real sense of a creaky old man climbing a doomed set of stairs on his way to oblivion. Sam and Joe first note that they can absorb Claire's abilities, but don't quite know why, not really knowing anything about Team Lonely and the sacrifice that they made. They push on ahead themselves. This idea of environmentally swapping between skills is a fun one, and it certainly carries the game through its last two chapters, as we acclimatise to our new characters. As Mike said when I reached out to him, To be honest, the second part kinda grew organically from the idea that I wanted environmental power-ups. It was either a case of removing abilities from the core cast, or adding a new cast who could benefit from the powers. I remember thinking, hell, I've used up a good sequel idea here. And yeah, he did use up a good sequel idea here, but to be honest, the natural conclusion to Thomas was to see what Team Lonely's sacrifice did, how it empowered the other AI. His words, not mine. Perhaps Mike thought that saving that for a sequel would mean releasing a part two which felt a little stretched out. At the end of the day, I don't need eight chapters of Grey being a manipulative little bastard while Sam and Joe take aeons to figure out he's not to be trusted. Two chapters is perfect to capture that. It doesn't take long for Grey to abandon Paul, leaving his slower companion behind and joining up with the more sprightly Sam and Joe. 
He's desperate and greedy to find a way out of the world before anyone else, and tricks Sam and Joe into helping him, planning to get rid of them later. Most interestingly, his lie is quite reminiscent of another rectangle story. Grey had told the couple he was looking for a lost friend. He'd made something up about being alone on a quest for lost allies. They had eaten it up. Again, I'm not certain if this is just a convenient lie or some poetic storytelling, but Grey using Thomas's story, using the explanation he probably gave Sarah when he first met her, suggests to me that when Team Lonely sacrificed themselves, it wasn't just their abilities which exploded into the system. Perhaps their memories, their personalities did as well. Paul recruits Team Jump in his quest to stop Grey, and they are the most ridiculous characters in the story. By far the smallest quadrilaterals in the game, this team of five always comes as a unit, working together to overcome obstacles and climb ledges, and they're probably my biggest criticism of the game. They feel so underutilised in the story, and there's so much in the way of possibility here. It would have been nice if perhaps Paul had a particular flaw which Team Jump helped to bring out of him. Maybe he was a coward, and it was Team Jump who gave him the idea to sacrifice Grey to the Pixel Cloud at the end. Perhaps they had to leave one of their number behind to progress. A sad moment, but they'll swallow their grief and tell Grey it was for the best. Instead, we get a throwaway reference of how it was dangerous for them, so before the final level, Paul will go on ahead, leaving Team Jump to just... platform in limbo, I suppose? I'm not massively sure what happened here. These guys are as cute and adorable as the rest of the characters, arguably more so due to their silly hive mind and name. It's a real shame. Team Sequel are transported to level 9.9. .9. They are moments away from the portal which will transport them out of the system. Paul, Grey, Sam and Joe all arrive at the same point, and Paul has an idea. The Pixel Cloud had been separated from its allies for some time. She'd not heard the order to retreat. She was shocked by the appearance of the four aberrations below. There's something really epic about this moment. Paul is old, he's frail, he can't jump very high, so needs the help of Sam and Joe to climb the stairs. As you watch these three rectangles bop up and down, wrenching themselves up some ledges, just bear in mind that what we're actually seeing is an old man who's about to sacrifice himself, desperately climbing a cliff face with the help of two kids who don't even know what he's about to do. Mike has mentioned in the past that the idea for Thomas Was Alone came from when he was watching Oh Brother Where Art Thou with a friend. He claimed that he wanted to create a game with this idea of different characters needing to rely on each other to solve puzzles. He wanted to design puzzles which incorporated a chain mechanic of sorts. But when he started to attempt it, he realised it was simply going to be too difficult for him at the time, so rewired the game to be about jumping squares. This moment with Paul, Sam and Joe shows me the potential that idea could have had. Whilst there isn't a chain mechanic here, each character needs to use the help of the others to lift themselves to the next level, and it tends to play through with the knowledge of what's about to happen. I also find it fitting that Grey, who, remember, has been plotting the murder of Sam and Joe this entire time, has one last act before his downfall. He leaps over to the other side of the level, and helps Sam and Joe climb up to their own portal. Then, returning to where Paul waits patiently for him, the rain splashing down from above, there's a tense standoff between the two, as if they're standing on a cliff edge. It isn't until the pixel monster appears once again and swallows Grey up that he realises that he's been tricked. Paul sacrifices both himself and Grey to the monster to give the kids a chance to escape. It's heartbreaking. Sam and Joe are the ones who make it. After Grey is defeated, the two are transported to our final level where they go in the only direction which makes sense, up and to the right. There's no denying that the final moments of the game are almost rapturous to bring it back to the spiritual metaphor I mentioned earlier. The two ascend into a bright light, locking into place before breaking out into the real world. If Team Lonely carried this theme of embracing what makes you different and using that to make the world a better place, Team Sequel's theme is slightly different. Paul, Grey, Sam and Joe are less introspective than our original cast. I'd go so far as to say that just like how they're an evolution of the beings which preceded them, their theme is an evolution of that as well, 
focusing down into what makes Thomas alone so poignant for most people who play it. See, it's not those final seconds soaring up through the beam of light which makes this last level so evocative, it's this. The last action you do in Thomas Was Alone, the last piece of gameplay, the last puzzle that the game asks you to figure out is a clean, easy, but important one. Joe waddles into the corner, Sam jumps on top of her and leaps upwards to push a button, just like the sort of puzzles Chris and Thomas did at the start of the game. The last thing we see two characters do in the game is work together. The last thing you do as the player is link these friends together and get them to do what we all should do. Rely on and work with each other. Thanks for watching. I love this game so much, it still shocks me how gameplay with a central idea of rectangles jumping can be, with just a few tweaks, something engaging, smart, and both heartbreaking and inspirational to play. It's a game that should be played to be experienced, I think anybody who's engaged with it can agree. Feeling your brain slowly come to terms with and be reprogrammed into building each character's abilities to achieve an end goal is what attaches us to the characters, even the narcissistic John or the old and creaky Paul. I think that with everything that's going on right now, a game which reminds us that sometimes it's okay to lean on someone for help if you need it is an important one to fill that hole in your soul that perhaps 2020 is dug at. But hey, what did you think? Did I miss anything? What's your first indie game which made you fall in love with these smaller titles? Let me know down in the comments and like I said before, if you like what you saw, maybe like and subscribe too. If you want to see something equally as light, why not check out my Cuphead video and if you're in the mood for some cathartic rage, I have a way too long critique of why Marvel's Avengers is a complete garbage fire of a game. Seriously, not a good game. Anyway, thanks again and as always, take care.